We have a lot of people here, but we have a lot of people missing. Normally, I start class on time. It's only the first week or two that I start a little late to give people a time to drift in. Somebody just come in, I don't think so. All right, give me a chance. Okay, I assume you can all hear me. Uh, I was just talking to my friend Christian here about how this is not the best way to go to school. How we wish we could all be together. Uh, but we can't, and we're not sure what to do about it. I just want to keep going here. Got that. Well, I'm trying. Oh, good. Okay. So, we all wish we could be together. So, as I said, I've been teaching this course for years, but we've never taught it online. And normally, what we do is the questions at the end of the chapter. So I'm now on page 40, 44. I'm going to read the first question. I'll give you the answer to that one. When I get to 45, maybe we can have a little not discussion, but maybe you can volunteer some answers. And we're going to take 10 or 15 minutes to see if this works. Now, I've tried it with two of my other sections, and it seems to work. We don't really have homework in this course. So this is the only way to make sure that we understand stuff. If you do not have the book, uh, today, with no penalty, I'm still taking attendance. However, I would like it if you could have the book by next week or the week after at the latest. Page 44, chapter, page 1, it says, what is the following basic uh, function of a computer? And it says, choose all. There are three answers. And the answer is A, C, and E. That is input, output, and processing. A, C, and E. I hate to be distracted, but it's very important I take attendance, so I'm still doing that. Uh, no, yeah. Gabriel Pinella, your first test is not this week, it's th two or three weeks from now. Okay, now page 45. Uh, which of these blank it, it executes the instructions? Um, one more time, please keep yourself muted, but either answer me through chat or one of you unmute and tell me the answer. So which of these executes the instructions, A, B, C, or D? Who wants to tell me? Oh, okay, everybody, I see about three people. And the answer is the CPUA. That's right. Uh, but, and by the way, these are Mickey Mouse questions here. They get much more interesting in later chapters. The CPU has uh, two or more processors inside it. Is that several, is that uh, A, B, C, or D, and Y? Number three, A, B, C, or D, multi-watt. Multi what? Yes, I see about three answers. B, the cores, cores, multi core. Number four. Now, number four is a big cuidado. Um, number four, there's two answers. A long term storage. Two of those are long term, two are short term. Which two are long term storage? Number four. Uh, whoever said C and D is wrong. Right, it's A and D. So it's the USB or flash drive, and it's also the hard drive. C is not, B and C are short-term storage. Okay, now number five is interesting. It says, what, which uh, component controls data transfers between it? Number five is interesting because I didn't cover it in lecture. You say, well, Professor, why didn't you cover it in lecture? Well, it wasn't prompted in my PowerPoints. So the only person who can answer number five correctly is someone who actually did the reading. Who wants to tell me the answer to number five? Yes, I see two or three of you. I'm on, yes, the chipset. And you'd only know that if you have done the reading. Um, number six is D, PCI Express. I don't care about it. Number seven is another one that's a little bit tricky. Only if you did the reading would you know it. So you've got the road, the, he the, the, the head is moving along the platter to find stuff. And 
the time it takes to find the spot in the platter is that rotational delay seek time blah 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 which one is that uh yes that is called the seek time and gabriel and whoever the other two people who answered correctly the only way you could have possibly known that is you must have done the reading and by the way i didn't leave that out as a test for you guys i only left it out because the powerpoints didn't prompt me in other words i teach the class by my knowledge and the powerpoints give me an idea of what to talk about if they don't prompt me to say something then i don't bother to say it right or wrong that's what i do i'm a little distracted because i'm checking to make sure i have everybody's name uh that i didn't miss anybody and, and i don't want to call attendance i'd be I, I got that i got that okay we're down to uh we're now on page 46 top of the page which is a task performed by the bios now i think yeah there's two of them so which two of those are in the bios uh, who said for said A and D? The post test, yes. And begin the boot procedure, yes. They're both in the bios. I'm checking again. Aha, uh -huh. I got you. I, I got you when you came in. All right, I think I have most people here. So it's A and D. Now, my favorite one is number nine. Number nine doesn't have an answer. What they want you to do with number nine is put it in order. So which one is which? So somebody tell me, first of all, the, this is the uh, boot procedure, the BIOS. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. What of those five steps or six steps, which one do you do first? What's step number one? Powers applied. Yes, powers applied, which is D. D is number, powers applied, D. Now what happens number two? What's the next one? Uh, actually, it's a great idea, but whoever's answering, Christian Bianco, no, not quite. What happens after number one, powers apply? Something happens. The uh, the CPU starts its B. Now, I know what you're confused about. To me, the next step is number three. But the next step, number three, is really the first step of the BIOS. So after the one is D and two is B, what happens next? This is a good one. What happens? What's the next thing that happens? Uh, I can barely read some of you, but I think some of you have it. Y yes, the Gabriel Pinella, the post test is executed. Now, the reason why a lot of people thought that should be number one is that's the first step of the BIOS. But after you turn the power on, after the CPU starts, then the post test. So I would say that's true. Three is E. Now, what's the next thing that happened? What's number four? What's, not, what's the next thing that happens? Number four. F, the boot devices are, whoever's three people set up, the boot devices are started. So now we have four is F. Now we only have two more to go. So what's five and six? Five is A. The CPU is loaded, you always loaded into RAM. And obviously number six is the services are started. So let's do it one more time. Number one is D, the power is applied. Number two, the CPU starts, B. Number three, E, the post test is, is executed. Number four, F, the boot devices are enabled. Uh, number five is A, the operating system is loaded into RAM. And number six, the operating system is started. When they say OS, they mean Windows. Okay. Let me just stop for a minute. That kind of gibberish is exactly what I would want to know on my test and what they would want to know on the certification test. That type of thing is exactly what this course is about. All right, I'm going to go. I, I don't like these questions particularly, but I'm going to go a few more and then we'll stop. So, um, number 10 is B, device driver. I don't care much about that. Number 11 is semi important. So, let's talk about it. Which of these, A, B, C, D, or E, requests information? What year was Susan B. Anthony born? Is that A, B, C, or D? Who is doing right? Bianco, you're very good. The network client asked us the request. You may thank me, but you're going to uh, curse me when I get to up chapter seven. We do the seven layers, because you're going to have to know the seven layers cold. Okay, um, a few more questions. I think we'll stop because I'm getting bored with this. Uh, 47, top of the page. TCPIP. Is that A, B, C, D? 
Uh, okay, I got several people who are sound smart. It is a protocol D. All the people who said protocol D. For those who don't know, I'm not just answering myself. I'm seeing chat messages from people. Penella, you seem on top of this. Miss Iman, you seem on top of this. So it, it's an example of protocol. We're going to have an entire chapter on it. I think it's chapter four. Now, 14 is a biggie, and that could be on my next test, hint, hint. In network communication, which address is used to deliver a frame to the correct computer? And cuidado, two of them. There's two answers. One is the answer, and one is just the other name for the answer. Christian Bianco, you're right, but who else? Yes, several people. Leonard, Leonard, you're right, too. So the answer is it's the MAC address that does that. The MAC address that does that, that's A. And another name for the MAC address is the physical address. So it's A and D. One more time, the answer is the MAC address. But another name for the MAC address is the physical address. Be cuidado, that might, could, would be on my test. 15 is B, ping. I didn't really talk about that. 16 is A, D, and S. I didn't really talk about that. 17, muy importante. The unit of information that has the MAC address and an error checking at the end, do we call that a packet, a ping, a frame, or a chunk? If it has the MAC address, is it called a packet, a ping, a frame, or a chunk? Everybody answering me, you're correct. I'm a little upset that, that more of you aren't answering, okay? But the answer for those who are saying it is C, a frame. C, a frame. Whoever said DNS, that is the answer to 16, okay? But 17, remember, the packet contains only the IP address, but the MAC address contains the frame. Everybody, knowing those two things is extremely important. That will be on my first test. 16, adding stuff to it is V encapsulation. I think I'm going to stop just because I'm running out of work. Oh, no, this is a biggie. We'll do one or two more, and then we're going to start the lecture. Now, remember what I said when I'm starting the lecture today. I have two days, today and next Wednesday, to finish all of Chapter 2. So how I'm going to do it, I don't know. But we're going to finish Chapter 2 this week. And next week, Monday, Wednesday, we're going to finish Chapter 3. Page 48, top of the page. You are a network administrator for a company that has just expanded from one floor to another floor. You had 50 computers on one floor. You had another 50 on the other floor to get 100. You're concerned network performance will suffer if you add computers to the existing land. In addition, new users will be working on a separate a business unit. And, and there are reasons to logically separate them. Okay. When you have one floor and another floor, 50 on each floor, Will you end up with a WAN, a MAN, an internetwork, or an extended LAN, and why? The, the three or four people answering, you're correct. But uh, does anybody want to unmute and tell me why the answer is what you're all saying? I'll tell you if you don't know. But the three or four people answer me, you're right. I wish more people would answer. Uh, one last thing. I assume some of you still don't have the book, and I'm not upset. Hopefully by next week at this time you will have it. My tip again, you can buy it for the bookstore at $170, whatever, if you want to. But a better way to get the book is to order it online, and you should be able to get it very cheaper. All right, any, but the three people who answered, you're correct. Does anybody else have anything to say? It is an internetwork because what you have is a LAN on the first floor of 50 people. Now, when you add the 50 people on the second floor on top, could you put them in the same LAN? You could. And then you'd have an extended land. But there's a question in the middle that says you're concerned that network performance will suffer if you add computers to the existing land. So what'd you do? You made a land, you had a land on the eighth floor, and you made another land on the ninth floor. Now you've got a problem. You've got two separate lands. What's the only way to connect two separate lands? With a router. When you connect two separate lands with a router, what do you have? That's the definition of an internet world. Knowing LAN, WAN, MAN on my first test is extremely important. Okay? Uh, 20 is B, asking questions. I'm going to skip most of the rest because I'm not interested in most of it. I'm going to, yeah, okay. So I think we got it. All right, I finished taking attendance. So, because here's my problem. When I go to start the lecture, I, you all look great. I see your smiling faces. 
when I'm not going to be able to see your faces when I start the lecture and I can't see who's here or who's not. So I think I've taken attendance as best as I can. All right. Having said that, is give me a second. Drift off for a minute if you want. Okay. So. There we go. Okay. I assume everybody is seeing uh, 7th edition chapter 2. You're all seeing that? Okay, I assume nobody's squawking, so you're not. All right, so I'm going to slowly, it's about 3.30. For 45 minutes or so, uh, I will do as much of this as I can. You're going to take copious notes, and you're going to be ready for this when we have our first test, which is about two or three weeks away. All right? I'm turning my light off because I don't need to read anything anymore. I assume the dead silence means you're all seeing it. Good. Okay. I skip objectives. Right. Okay. In the old days, we didn't use repeaters. We connected it completely together. The reason I'm going to skip this slide is we're going to do this in mind-numbing detail in Chapter 3. So a week from today, when we get to Chapter 3, I'll be explaining how we used to connect computers together and why that's no good. This is today's lecture, and it's very important. See the difference? See the top of the screen where it says network repeaters and hubs? What's the difference? Well, they're the same thing. Well, they're similar, but they're not the same. We want to go a long distance. In other words, I want to send to a computer a long ways away. Some computer problems are resolved with something called the repeater. The repeater receives the signal, strengthens them, and then sends them. Now, I don't have a blackboard, so you'll wash my hands if you can. This is a logic one, and that's a logic zero. Logic one is up here, logic zero is down here. What happens is, as the logic one keeps going through wires longer and longer, what happens is the logic one keeps shrinking because it keeps wearing out. So pretty sure here's a logic zero and here's a logic one. Well, you say, Professor, I can barely see it. The logic one is barely above the zero. How do I know that's a one and not a zero? And the answer is you don't because it's got too weak. So what am I going to do? I'm going to receive the signal. I'm going to strengthen the signal and repeat the strengthened signal over. So once I receive the signal, I boost it up to here, and now I send this logic one and not this one. Do you have to know that for a test? No, it's the second dot. In doing that, what does that accomplish? It gives me a longer distance, dot two. The repeater enables you to connect computers whose distance from one to another would make it impossible. Without the repeater, I can only go this far. With the repeater, I can go this far. So the repeater extends the distance of the network. That's its only purpose. One more time, the repeater extends the distance of the network. How does it do it? By strengthening the signal. What's its purpose? To make the network longer, to go further. In other words, the more amplitude I put in the signal, or the more juice I put in the signal, the further it can go. Know that for a test. Now, let's do it. These guys can talk to these guys, but to go over to here, they got to go through this repeater to get the signal to go the distance. These guys can talk to these guys, okay, but this guy can't reach this guy. It's too far. By going through the repeater, the signal is amplified. What does it do? It extends the distance. Know that for my test. I, I assume the dead silence means you understand this, but my big cuidado with all this stuff is because I have so much to lecture on, I may repeat some of this next meeting, but I won't be able to do chapter one ever again, and I won't be able to do chapter two after this week is out. So every week is a new chapter, but you still have to know the old ones. So be sure to try to write this down, take notes, and read the book, because we're not going to be able to go over it 20 times. Okay. The repeater only had two. Remember, it went from one to the other. If I have several, that's a multiport repeater. A multiport repeater is a hub. Now I'm going to come back to the slide in a minute, but I'm going to move ahead. Do you see what I meant? In this one, I just went here to go all the way here. In this one over here, it's a multiport repeater. When I send to this, the signal is amplified, and a copy is sent to all other five people. When I send in here, the signal is amplified, and a copy is sent to everybody else. 
When this guy sends to here, he only wants to talk to this computer over here, but he can't avoid having a copy go to everybody. So let's go back a slide. A multi-port repeater is a repeater with several ports. That's called a hub. It receives the signals. Third dot, it cleans them up. And then the fourth dot's the big one. It regenerates them. What's its purpose? Well, its purpose is the same as the hub. It's to extend the distance. So it does extend the distance, but extends the distance to multiple computers. One more time, repeater just sends it in one direction. A hub sends it to multiple computers. And that's the difference. A hub is a multi-port repeater. What do they have in common? They take the signal, they clean it up, and then the fourth one down, they regenerate the signal to full strength and send it. The reason they want to put it full strength is not because it looks sexier, it's to make it go further. We're tr in both cases, we're extending the distance. Know that from my first test. And by the way, this is a pretty simple um, chapter, but I can't tell you how critical it is. If you go into a job interview and you mix these up, you're done. So if you don't know this in a job interview, you might as well not attend it. Knowing this won't get you the job, but not knowing it will avoid getting you the job. Everybody's got that? One more time, I want you to stay muted. But if anybody has a question, you can ask it two ways. You can send a chat thing, what does this mean? Or you could unmute yourself and just say, this is so-and-so, I have a question. You're more than welcome to interrupt me. But I don't want it open if you're not, because in the other class, some girl's grandmother was yelling at her in the background, and we heard it all, so we don't want to hear that. <laughs> okay, there's a multi-port repeater. They call this a hub. But you send in, and everybody gets a copy. Now, this is on the test, too, whoever's asking. The top dot, what's bandwidth? Well, bandwidth is the speed of the network, and the speed of the network is measured in bits per second. And that's the answer we can mull on, but I want to explain it. When you're in a car, how do you know how fast you're going? Well, you're sitting in a car, and you're eating up the miles under you. So 20 miles an hour, you travel for 20, uh, one hour, you hit eight, eight up 20 miles. Going 60 miles an hour, you travel for one hour, and 60 miles went under. We measure speed a little differently. You see the first little line under there? What if you sat the side of the road and 10 cars went by in a second? That would be 10 cars per second. But you sat on the side of the road and 100 cars went by in a second, they're obviously going a lot faster. So in other words, what you're going to do is sit on the side of the road, and if 10 bits went by in a second, that's 10 bits per second. If 100 bits went by in a second, that's 100 bits per second. And if 1,000 bits went by in one second, that's 1,000 bits each second. Bandwidth is the speed of data measured in bits per second. Everybody know that on my first test. Bandwidth is the speed of the data measured in bits per second. High bandwidth, high speed. Low bandwidth, low speed. Know that. Okay? Now, having said that, hubs use bandwidth sharing. What I mean by that is, watch carefully. If I send to you, in here, at high speed, you get one quarter of the speed, you get one quarter of the speed, I have to dilute the speed. So when I send in here, very high speed, you get a fraction of it, you get a fraction of it, you get a fraction of it. So, hubs have bandwidth sharing, where they all have to share the bandwidth. And that's a bad thing. And you say, well, why is it a bad thing? I get the frame of the packet, don't I? Well, yes, the good thing is you get the information. The bad thing is you get the information at a much slower speed. Well, why? Because you got to get part of the speed, and you got to get part of it, and you got to get part of it. You all got to share the speed. Do it again. Hubs use bandwidth sharing, and bandwidth sharing is a bad thing. Why is bandwidth sharing a bad thing? Because it slows you down. It goes slower. Okay, but before we move on, I, I know you're taking notes. This was a big breakthrough. Why? This allowed a lot of computers to talk to each other directly. So for many years, uh, inventing it, having a hub, using bandwidth sharing, getting it, everybody can talk to everybody with this. It's not the end of the world. It's a good thing to do. But some genius came along and said, well, okay, it works. I got it. Can we improve on this? Can we make this better? I hope you're all listening because this lecture is very important. And hint, hint, a lot of this stuff will be on my first test. I don't do indicator lights. Everybody laughs at me, but I don't care about them. 
Okay, here we go. We're going to replace a hub with something called a switch. And what does it say? The switch looks exactly like the hub and does the same thing. So therefore, the switch and the hub are the same, right? Well, no. They do something big difference. Look what it says. It says the switch actually reads the data in the message and determines which ports it's connected to and forwards the message to that port and only that port and no one else. So if I'm sending into the switch and it's going to you over there, it only goes to you. Everybody else doesn't get a copy. Well, wait a minute. That's a great thing. Why didn't the hub do that? Because the hub is too stupid. It doesn't have. The switch has extra circuitry that can do that. Now, there's a little misnomer here. It says on the top, the switch reads the data in the message. What it really means, it reads in the message, it reads the to and from address. So it says, you're not Zelda, you're not Gertrude, you're 2B7C84. You're not Joe, you're not Pete, you're 2D8467. So it reads your, your MAC address, and it sends it to wherever you are by that MAC address. But because it knows where you are, it can forward it to you only and not to anyone else. So how is a switch different? Well, a switch sends the data only to the person it's going to and to no one else. The hub sends a copy to everybody. I always do the example. I've done this in my other classes. Do you really want to get your neighbor's mail? And the answer is, I think it would be a pain in the neck to get old Mrs. Jones's mail across the street. I want to get my mail. I don't want to get copies of your mail. So this, the switch is really a better thing. You get your data and you don't get copies of other people. But, and that's great, the lecture's over, but we have to figure out how do we do that? Well, we, we, we do it here. And I don't read PowerPoint, so here's why. It re the frame, the MAC address has a frame. Now, anybody paying attention last week, we talked all about the frame and the MAC address. So we're saying, I know where you are by your MAC address, and I forward it to you. Well, how do I know where you are? Because the switch has a complete record called a switching table. Now, why doesn't a hub do this? A hub doesn't have anything inside it. It's just got to forward to everybody. It says, I got to get this out to everybody else. The switch says, hold the phone, Jack. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to consult this table. I'm going to say, now I know where you are. I'm only going to send to you. But in order to do that, the switch has to have the switching table. That means the switch needs a lot of extra circuitry. Therefore, a switch is a more sophisticated device. And the switch is a, give me a drum roll, a more expensive device. So a switch forwards frames by the MAC address, and it's a much more expensive device. Anybody missing last week or didn't mind paying attention last week, you should know what a MAC address is and what an IP address is and how they're different. The switch uses the MAC address to forward the frame. And that's why a hub and a switch are not anything like each other. Do they do the same thing? Yes. Do they do it the same way? No. The hub sends to everybody. The switch only sends to the destination computer and to no one else. We're nowhere near done with this, but there's no questions, any comments, you're all set. All right. Let's keep going very slowly. I'm watching my watch. We'll be here about a half an hour more. Uh, we're going slowly, but not too slowly. And I have all this class and all next class to finish chapter two. Okay, let's take a look at this. This says that if I want to go to AAA1, I should go out port number six. Well, let's check it. Here is port number one, two, three, four. Here's port number six. If I go out slot number six, what do I come to? I come to AAA1. This says if I want to go to BBB1, I should go out slot number one. See, I go out slot number one. Who do I come to one? So, CC1 out slot number two. Go out slot number two. Yeah, there's CCC1. How do I know this? This table is in this switch. So, when the frame comes in, it consults the table and goes to the correct place. One more time. When the frame comes in, it consults the table and then goes to the correct place. A quick reminder, I hope you can see my PowerPoints on the screen, but you all have copies of these PowerPoints through Moodle. This is a Chapter 2 PowerPoint. Some students actually print them out and take notes on the PowerPoint. You don't have to do that, but you can. Some students print them out and study the PowerPoints from the printed version. You don't have to do that, but you can. Okay, so, and these PowerPoints are not mine. They came from the uh, textbook. That's why we want the 7th edition, because these PowerPoints go with the 7th edition. Okay. Uh-huh. 
how do I get this thing? So here's what happens. The switch receives the frame. The switch looks at the source and now they use source and destination and because I'm teaching online, I can't draw on the blackboard. When I draw on the board, I always use the word to and from. So to and from is source and destination. Destination, who's it going to? And source, who's it coming from? Not to and from Zelda to Seymour, but to and from 1B74 to 2D87, from one address to the other. The switch reads the addresses. Number three, the switch looks up the, the, the destination, who's going to MAC address in the switching table. So let's see, this is going to 2B7C. Let me check the switching table and find out who that belongs to. And then number four, the switch forwards the frame to that person only who it found in the switching table, and we have much more efficiency. That's how the switch forwards the frame. But the one that's a little tricky is the very last one. How does the switching table get there to begin with? Who puts it there? And the answer is, well, you got to type it in. Well, if you had to do that, you go crazy. So what happens is number five is one of the biggest one. The switch then says, okay, uh, Joe over there, I delivered your frame. But now let's talk about you. Who are you? You say, wait a minute, I was sending a frame to Zelda. Why do you care about me? I want to know who you are and where you are. So the switch then looks at your source address. Who did it come from? It says, the reason I want to know who you are and where you are is in the future, if I ever get a, a frame address to you, I want to know where you are. So the thing says, now that I delivered it to Zelda, you, Joe, are at 2B8457, and you're in slot four. I want to write that down. You say, well, why bother? Because in a few minutes, a frame may come to you, and now I know where you are. The switch doesn't. The switching table doesn't get typed in. The switching table auto-learns itself. As people send frames to and from each other, the switching table detects where the frame came from and puts it in there. The next time a frame comes to you, I know where you are. When you first turn on a switch, it follows the frames to all the ports. Why? It doesn't know where anybody is. But as frames come through the switch, says, let's see, now I know where you are. Let's see, now I know where you are. Let's see, now I know where you are. And it slowly builds a switching table. Understand how a switch uses a switching table based on MAC addresses to forward frames. Step number five, very important. The switching table is updated with the source MAC address and now knows where you are for future reference. If someday someone says something to you, now I know where you are on my switching table. So here it is, note takers. The switch forwards frames based by the destination address. One more time, the switch forward, switch forwards frames based on the destination MAC address. But the switching table builds itself based on the source MAC address. The switching table builds the switching table based on the source MAC address, but it forwards frames based on the destination MAC address. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. We have to know what I just said, okay? I'm hoping a lot of you are concentrating on this, doing the reading and pouring over it. This is not difficult stuff, but I can't emphasize how important all this is. If you're in a job interview and know this stuff, you may not impress the person. If you don't know this stuff, you'll be thrown out of the job interview instantly, okay? Not knowing this stuff will get you out the door. They have a little button, they press a shoot, and you fall through a crack. All right? This is not too hard, but you have to study. We only went through 12 slides so far. I'm going to keep going as slow as I can. Okay. Yeah, the switching table organizes the MAC address and knows the destination, but it builds it from the source. So you build the switching table from the source MAC address, so you'll know the destination MAC address when you have to deliver that's what I mean by Peter Piper picked a peck up. It's a tongue twister. You're building it by the source MAC address, but it's going to become the destination MAC address when you're delivering the frame. It's a little tricky, but it's not that hard. Okay, um, as usual, I mean, class ends at 4.30. We'll probably end at 4.15, 4.20. And I have all day today, and I have all day on uh, Wednesday to finish this entire chapter. Once I'm done with this chapter, we're not doing it ever again, and next week we go to chapter three. For those who are asking about tests, the week of the test, the week of the review, we have reviews. Every week, we still have to cover a full chapter. So the week of the test, we're still covering another chapter. When we do a review, we're still covering another chapter. We never have a week go by that we don't do another chapter. Okay, um, switches use dedicated bandwidth. Now, this is a tricky one. 
Why? Well, when I send only to you, and I don't have to send everybody else, but just to you, I can give you the full speed. Let's do it again. When it comes into a hub, you get part of the speed, you get part of the speed, you get part of the speed. Hubs you shared bandwidth, that's a bad thing because it slows you down. A switch uses dedicated bandwidth, and that's a good thing because it why? It speeds you up. I'm coming in blindingly fast. I'm only sending to you and no one else. You get the full speed. Switch uses dedicated bandwidth. That's a good thing because it speeds you up. Now, do we have to know the stupid half and full duplex? We do, but it's pretty easy. Half duplex is like a walkie-talkie. Remember CB radio? You have to say 10-4, and he sends. Then you have to say 10-4, and then he sends. CB radio, half duplex. If I'm talking, you got to shut up. If you're talking, I got to shut up. Full duplex is like a telephone. I can interrupt you. So, hubs use half duplex only. When you're sending, I, can't, I have to be quiet. When I'm sending, you have to be quiet. One way at a time, hub. With a switch, I can send data to you, and you can send data back to me at exactly the same time. Switches can be full duplex, sending data in both directions at the same time. A hub is half duplex, one direction at a time, but not both. No, so a question, so that means that there's no collision in uh, in a switch, because there's collision indicators on a hub that when uh, information, you know, at the same time is colliding, then they both get sent back, right? Is that correct? Well, here's what she said that's correct. There is no collisions with a switch because you know who you're sending it to, and you should never collide with a switch, but you can have collisions with a hub. Absolutely okay. correct. Did you write the textbook? <laughs> Yeah. Therefore, can you see the bottom dot? We prefer to do switches. Why do we want switches? Well, switches are full duplex. That's a better thing. And switches have dedicated bandwidth, which gives us faster. And as the young lady just said, it also there's no collisions. Do not confuse a hub and a switch. They are different. Now, they do the same thing, but they do them in different ways. Therefore, today we only use switches. We don't use hubs. But if on a job interview, you use them interchangeably, he's going to be very unimpressed. You know what I mean? Because we want to use switches. We don't want to use hubs, because hubs are old-fashioned, switches are new-fashioned. So you want to make sure you emphasize on any kind of interview that you really have this comfortable. And the way you have it comfortable, you really, really read this and memorize it and know it cold. All right, let's keep going. Indicator lights, I don't care. Now, we're going to switch gears. I, I'm following the power points. I don't really want to, but we're going to switch gears. This is important. It's not a test, but I, I wouldn't have laid it out this way, but they are. And that is, we're going to talk about wireless access points. And you know that wireless access points use radio waves. I send it to the wireless access point radio wave. So the test question is number two, B, the second dot, where it says access points operate similarly to a hub without wires, not a switch without wires. And think how that works. I am the access point. I want to send the radio wave only to you, Ms. Zelda, just you and nobody else. So I send the radio wave to you because I'm sending you a message. But it's radio, okay? Where's it going to go? It's going to go everybody. So even though I'm only sending to you, Ms. Zelda, everybody else is going to get a copy because radio works that way. Remember how they always say, don't say mushy stuff to your girlfriend on a CB radio. Why? Everybody can eavesdrop. You can't have a private conversation on a CB radio because anybody listening in can hear it. So if I'm sending data to you only, it's like a hub without wires because it's sent to a copy to everybody. Now, do I want that? I don't want that. But how can I send a radio wave only to you? And the answer is I can't because radio goes every place. Know that a wireless access point is like a hub without wires. Okay? Because everybody gets a copy whether they want to or not. Now, I wish that was the entire lecture on wireless, but it isn't. So stick with me on this next part. And that, screw that. Okay, so it's similar what to a wired hub. Wireless access point is a wireless hub similar to a wired hub. But I want to talk about the near the bottom where it says RTS and CTS. So how does it work? Well, I want to talk to the access point. So my device says to the access point, oh, mighty access point, I want to talk to you. But at the same time, your device and your device is sending. The request to send is the message from the device to the access point saying, can I talk to you? Can I send some data? Can I ask you a question? 
Well, the access point is overwhelmed. He says, wow, I can't do it. I can't do everybody at once. So what happened with the teacher? Well, you all raise your hand. And what would I say? Okay, okay you Zelda go, you Gertrude go, you Peter go. So one at a time. So when the access point calls on one of the devices, that's the clear to send. So what happens is all the devices sent to the access point, I request, I request, I request. The request to send is from the device to the access point saying, can I talk to you? The access point says to one device, only you are clear to send. Okay, you're done. Okay, only you are clear to send. Okay, you're done. Only you are clear to send. No the difference between the request to send and the clear to send. The bottom dot, together, those two, that what I call kabuki dance together, that's called a handshake. That handshake is the guy saying, can I talk to you? And the access point saying yes. Know what request to send is, know what clear to send is, and know that that adds up to a handshake. Big cuidado, that only applies to wireless, not wired. Which leads to the following. All that extra chatter, the request to send, clear to send, does what? It slows you the heck down. So the middle dot's the big one. The effective bandwidth is wireless is always about half the bandwidth of a wired network. Now the third dot, please don't remember. They're saying 11 million bits per second is the speed of wireless. That was true five or 10 years ago. It's not true today. Don't memorize that. But the middle dot's very important. Wireless is always slower than wired. And part of the reason is this garbage here. So a lot of people say, you know, Professor, I've got blindingly fast internet. I pay a fortune for gigabit or 10 gigabit ethernet. Aren't I great? And I say, okay, what do you do? Oh, well, I sit home in my bed and I watch YouTube on my wireless device. Well, if you're paying for blindingly high-speed internet and then you're converting it to wireless to watch YouTube, you just cut your, your speed way down. Now, that's not necessarily bad. Um, if all you want to do is watch YouTube videos, you don't need high speed. You don't need super high speed. You can watch them at a slower speed. But if you need to do stuff and you're saying, I need the fastest possible, you've got to be plugged in. Wireless will always slow you down. So if you're trying to do stuff on the internet and you say, I'm paying for this blindingly high speed and I need it, you better make sure you're doing it from a wired, plugged-in computer because you're not getting the speed otherwise. No RTS, no CTS, no handshake, and know that the effective bandwidth of wireless is about half the speed of a wired network. Okay. I'm starting to wear out, but we have a few more slides. Lectures are cool, but two things happen. If I lectured for three hours, I'd be exhausted, but so would you. So, and I want to get this stuff across, but I'm still not where I want to get to yet. Okay, now we want to talk about network interface cards. I see, you know, as you can see, some slides are not important, but when I see a slide that is, I emphasize it. So network interface cards are in the motherboard and, and they interface with the network. Look, I got a computer and I can use my computer all by myself to, to play games and do what I want. But most of the time, like today with us, we're on the network, and if we're not on the network, we're screwed. How do I get on the network? Well, in my computer, I got a, a cable plugged in. That cable is interfacing with the network. So the network interface circuitry is the circuitry that lets my computer interface or connects with the network. Most network interface circuitry is built into the motherboard. But if that fails, or I want faster one, I might want to install a new network interface card. So let's go on. Okay. So if I knew the network card, okay, that is the thing that connects my computer to the network. Now, I love that term on the second thing where it says networking medium might be copper wire, fiber optic, or so-called airways. Copper wire is my RJ45. It's my CAT6 cable. Fiber optic would be fiber optic. And, of course, airwaves, there's no such thing. Airwaves, they mean invisible radio waves. But I would need a different NIC card. A NIC card that will let me plug in RJ45 is not the same NIC card that will let me plug in fiber optic, and that's not the same NIC card that will let me plug in uh, uh, a wireless. So I need a wireless NIC card to do wireless. I need a fiber optic NIC card to do fiber optic, and I need a cop, uh, an RJ45 NIC card to do that. I need a separate network interface card depending upon how I want to interface. That's very important. 
These two slides are tricky, and we're going to spend five or ten minutes on them. They're very important. I'm watching my watch, but I want these two, and we're going to get to a really tricky slide in a minute. So be very careful. Okay. It provides a connection from the computer to the medium, the medium being a wire. Now, incoming signal builds a frame, outgoing signal receives a frame. This slide's important, but you're not going to understand it until you see it. So let me go to the next one. Watch carefully. You are receiving. So in comes what? A frame. Now, people from last week who missed last week, if you remember, a packet contained only the IP address. The frame contained the MAC address. So the frame comes in, and now we go up the line to, to get the data from it. Can I zoom in? I don't think so. Is that better? All right, so, so let's try it. Let's take this one, which is better, though. I want to send something out. So coming down my in my computer is what's called a packet. There's a to and from IP address and data. I want to send that to you. But I can't send it to you. Why? Because I can only send it to you if, if it's a frame with a MAC address. So here's what happens. It goes into the NIC card. In the NIC card, here's the same mother sticking little packet here. Well, what I do is I frame the packet. I put a to and from MAC address and some error checking. Do you see why from last week it's called a frame? I took the packet and I framed it with stuff. The frame now contains the MAC address and I send it out. So here's the cuidado. I create the frame and send the frame in the network interface card. And I receive the frame and read the frame in the network interface card. Incoming. The frame comes in. I go, I take the frame and I do a strip tease. First I deframe it, then I depacket it, and then I have the data. A better example. I have a packet I want to send you. I put it into the NIC card. What does the NIC card do? It frames it with a MAC address and an IP address. Then what does it do? It sends it to you. I build and send the frame in the, in the NIC card, and I receive and read the frame in the network interface card. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Do so we have all of this? Okay. Basically, what this slide says is the same thing. Incoming messages verifies and removes the frame. Outgoing message receives the packet, creates the frame by adding it. Okay? That is very important. Now, do you see something else about the course? Hopefully, most of you were here last week if you missed. I did a packet of frame last week. Well, I'm not repeating last week's lecture, but now I'm using the packet of frame. See what I'm saying? So you had to know what it was. Now you have to really know what it is. And hint, 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 when we get to chapter three, I'm going to revisit a packet. By the first test you take, you better know cold what a packet and a frame is and how they're different. I have a question, Professor. Go, go. Um, does it matter? I'm going a little back to the last slide, I think. Um, does it matter because there's different um, network mediums that you can use, which is like we talked about? Ah, uh, good point. Yes. For grandma, listen up. It's still going to be a packet or frame. It's true it's going to be in one case a wireless frame. It's true in another case it will be a fiber optic frame. But it's still going to be a frame. It doesn't matter. The principle stays the same. Okay? She's right, but it's a good question. But no. The NIC card generates the frame, sends it, and also receives the frame. Oh, my God. We've got two slides. They're going to take me 10 minutes apiece. Well, we had to know what a MAC address is. And what do we say it was? It was in the frame. Do you understand that it's a 48-bit binary address? Now, what does that mean? One one zero one zero one zero forty eight mother sticking times. So if I said to you, write this down one one zero one zero one zero. You say, wait, professor, I can't write down forty eight ones and zeros. My feeble mind won't assimilate it. Well, the computer can easily read forty eight ones and zeros. That's what it wants. The MAC address is a forty eight bit binary address. Period. End of story. Because you're not that bright, and because you can't remember forty eight ones and zeros, it's going to express it in hexadecimal. Now, uh, I assume everybody here speaks English, French, or Spanish. Does everybody here speak fluent hexadecimal? Probably not. Do you know why primitive man, we use the decimal number system, 1 through 9, 10 through 19, 20 through 29. It goes 10 digits, right? 0 through 9, so it's 10 digits. Does everybody know why in the beginning of time we use the decimal number system? Uh, what did the caveman have that you have? When you take a bath at night, what do you have? Hopefully you have 10 fingers and 10 toes because early man had 10 fingers and 10 toes. That's exactly why we use the decimal number system. 
If anybody in my class has 12 fingers and 12 toes, my condolences. But I assume most of you have 10 fingers and 10 toes. So what's the hexadecimal? It's base 16. Let's try it. Now, here's where I miss it. I have not learned how to teach online, and I'm working on how to get some scratch paper. Here's where I would have gone to the blackboard, and I can't go to the board. So hopefully in some future lectures, I'll be doing stuff on a little marking pad. But right now, I don't know how. So let's try it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What comes after nine, ten? Well, in hexadecimal, what comes after nine is the letter A. The letter A is ten. The letter B is eleven. The letter C is twelve. Now, write this down and say, oh my God, we're going to go to Z. No, we're not. The letter A is ten. B is eleven. C is twelve. D is thirteen. E is fourteen. And F is fifteen. F is fifteen. What comes after F? Nothing. There's no G-H-I. It's F. What comes after F is 2-0. Two, so 2-0. Two, then 2-1, two, 2-2, two, two, up to 2-9. What comes after 2-9? Two, 2-A, two, 2-B, two 2-C, two 2-D, two 2-E, two 2-F. Two what comes after 2-F? 3-0. What comes after 3-0? 3-1, 3 2 3-3. Three, three, three. Up to what? 3-9. What comes after 3-9? Three, 3-A, three 3-B, three 3-C, three 3-D, three 3-E, three 3F. What comes after 3F? 4-0. The 4-9. For A, B, C, D, E, F. What comes after 4F? 5-0. The 5-9. 5A, B, C. That's the, that's the binary. That's the hexadecimal number system. So, you have to know that for a test. No, not all of it. Here's what you have to know on a test. On a test, you have to know the letter A is 10. The letter B is 11. The letter C is 12. The letter D is 13. The letter E is 14, and the letter F is 15. Okay? You do have to know that. You never get G, H, I, J, K. They don't exist. So hexadecimal number system has numbers 0 through 9 and letters A, B, C, D, E, F. It does not have the letter G, H, I, J, K. Now, you say, why do I need this? Well, mathematicians need this for all kinds of reasons that we don't need. But why is it a good idea to express a 48-bit binary address in 12 hexadecimal digits? Let's try it. I never thought of something else. My God. Does everybody here speak fluent binary? 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then 0, 1, 0, and then 0, 1, 1. Does everybody speak binary? Let's try it. I don't have a blackboard, so I'm in trouble. What is 0? Oh, 0 in hexadecimal and in regular is 0. So what's zero in binary? It's four zeros. Binary zero is zero, 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 zero. What is four? Well, four in hexadecimal and four in decimal is the number four, is in four figures. What is binary four? Binary four is 0100. 0100 is binary four. There's a one in the four spot. What is four again? Here it's 0100, and this is zero, 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 zero. So this is 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 0. That's how I'm converting it from binary thing. What's binary 3? Binary 3 is 0, 0, 1, 1. What's binary 1? Binary 1 is 0, 0, 0, 1. So let's try these two numbers together. This is 3, 0, 0, 1, 1. And this one is 0, 0, 0, 1. That takes care of these 8 bits. Here's where it gets really tricky. Okay. What's binary 5? Binary 5 is 0, 1, 0, 1. Binary 5 is 0, 1, 0, 1. 4 plus 1 is 5. But what's binary B? Now we're screwed. Well, let's remember. B is not really B. B is AB. A is 10 and B is 11. A is 10, B is 11. So what's the binary number for 11? The binary number for 11 is 1, 0, 1, 1. 8 plus 3 is 11. So the binary number for 11 is 1011. That takes care of those. Let's try 1A. Binary 1 is 0001. What is binary A? Well, there is no binary A, but A is 10, and there's a binary number for 10, and the binary number for 10 is 1010. Here's where it gets a royal flush, and here's where we get screwed. How do I do C4? Well, there is no binary number for C, obviously, but here we're doing hexadecimal C. Well, if A is 10 and B is 11, what is C? C is 12. What's the binary number for 12? 
The binary number for 12 is 8 plus 4. That's 1100. Zero, zero. Binary 12 is 1100. Zero, zero. That's the first four digits. And again, the last four is what's binary 4? Binary 4 is 0100. Zero, zero, zero. So do you see how I doped that out? You would have to know that A is 10, B is 11, and C is 12. You would have to know that. Okay? One last time. The computer doesn't care about that. We did it for you. Whenever I say that, the student all raises their hand and says, my God, Professor, skip it. I don't need it. I'll just stick with the ones and zeros. Well, the problem is the ones and zeros is how the computer reads it. But you couldn't remember 48 ones and zeros. And if you wrote them down, you probably mix one up. But you can remember 0440315B. So we actually are doing it for a favor to you. Okay? Next step, the one above it, 48 bits. All MAC addresses are 48 bits, but they're artificially broken up into those two 24-bit segments. And the most important one is the first 24 bits known as the OUI. And here's why. We want to make, uh, well, let's go above it once and we'll do it again. The, the second dot down, it says MAC addresses are stored on the NIC card. I want to make sure that no two NIC cards manufactured in the entire world have the same MAC address on it. Well, that'd be really difficult because there's factories in Singapore, there's factories in California, there's factories in Ethiopia. They're all over the place. How can I make sure? The way I do it is the third dot down. There's two 24-bit hex numbers. The first 24 bits of the MAC address are unique to that factory. So every MAC NIC card made in that Shanghai factory or every NIC card made in that California factory or every NIC card made in that African factory has the same 24 bits. And then the second 24 bits is Euro 01, Euro 02. So all the cards made in a certain factory share the first 24 bits made for that factory. The OUI stands for an organizationally unique identifier. It means it's unique to that factory. Therefore, theoretically, no two NIC cards made in the entire world should ever repeat MAC addresses. You see why this slide is so important. What is the MAC address? It's a 48-bit binary address. How is it expressed? It's expressed in hexadecimal. How is, it, how is it broken up? The first 24 bits is the OUI unique to that factory. The second 24 bits is unique to you. Euro 1, Euro 2, Euro 3. That Euro 1, Euro 2, Euro 3, that's in the second 24 bits, not the first. Okay? And the MAC address, I don't care about this so much. The MAC address is stored in the NIC. Now, the way they do it, they put it in ROM on the NIC, a read-only memory chip. So what? When, let me do it this way. If you want a new MAC address, you can't get one. You want to change your IP address, you just say, I want a new IP address. You want a new MAC address? Screw you. You can't change it. It's burned in. But the only way you get a new MAC address is one way. If you get a new network interface card, you have to get a new MAC address. So one more time. A new NIC card will give you a new MAC address whether you want it or not. But if you keep the same NIC card, then you can't get a new MAC address whether you want it or not. Okay? The MAC address is on the NIC card. And again, the top dot, that's why I went backwards. We want to make sure that every NIC produced has a unique MAC address. How do we do that? We do it by doing this. We do it by doing this. Okay? I'm still watching my watch. I'm going to break in a minute or two and we'll go home, but I want to see that we're doing a lot of stuff. I want to get through this slide because it's so difficult, and I'm then going to repeat it next time. This is critical and it's on a test. So let's do it once now and once next time, and then we'll go on a break and we'll go home. Okay. When a frame arrives at the network interface card, is it going to you? So let's say you're 285 Maple. The postman only delivers stuff addressed to 285 Maple. If it's 297 Maple, he delivers it down the block. So the only MAC address is yours. So your NIC card is 2B7C84. If all the frames going to 2B7C84, your NIC card says, hey, that's me. Hey, that's me. Come in, Mr. Frame. I need you. So anything that matches my address, I'm going to suck in and take in. If it goes to another address, my NIC card says, screw you. It says, go away. So it's called, it's a gatekeeper. My network card says, if this is addressed to someone else, it's going to bounce off. I'm not going to let it in. So if it matches the NIC card's burned in address, it lets me in. But there's one exception. It's called the calling all cards or broadcast. And this is a little bit tricky. I want to send a, a, 
a frame to everybody. And I left out you and I left out you and your incense. So if I want to send everybody, there's a so-called broadcast address. Any frames address to this address will go to everybody. And you know what this address is? This is you're gonna love this. This address is all binary ones. So if it's addressed to all binary ones, your Nick card says, wait a minute, it's not addressed to me, but I've been taught that this is an exception. If this, these frames were all addressed to me. I gave them in. These were not addressed to me. I got rid of them. This one's a unique frame. It's not addressed to me, but it's got a special address called 11111 all the way over. I'm going to suck that one in because I'm specially trained that that's a broadcast address. It's not really addressed to me. It's addressed to occupant or person who lives here. So I'm going to take it in. So it, two things it brings in. All frames addressed to me personally and all frames addressed to occupant or broadcast address. Here's the biggie. Why is it? <laughs> you're going to love this. Why is it FFFF? Well, let's try it. Let's go back to our previous slide. In hexadecimal, A is 10, B is 11, C is 12, blah, blah, blah. F is, the, is 15. F is 15. What's the binary number for 15? The binary number for 15 is 1111. So four ones is binary 15. So what is FFF? It's four ones. Followed by four more ones, followed by four more ones, followed by four more ones for 48 ones. FFFF is nothing more than 48 binary ones. And that's the broadcast address, which means all NIC cards will take that frame in, period. One more and we're going home, but this is one of the most difficult ones, so pay attention. Unless your NIC card decides to become something called promiscuous. If your NIC card decides to become promiscuous, it's going to suck in all the frames. Well, why would I want that? And the answer is I almost never would. Would you like it if the mailman said tomorrow, you know, I'm not going to deliver mail to this entire block. I'm going to deliver the entire block's mail to your front porch. You'd say, well, well how did I get elected? I don't want everybody's mail. I only want my own. So why would you want to be promiscuous? You wouldn't. What you would do is you would turn off the gatekeeper function and let it process all the frames it sees. Could you do that? Yes. Would you want to do it? No, I don't want to get your garbage. I only want my own. So the question now is, and this is tricky, why would I want to become promiscuous? Why would I want to take in all the frames? And the answer is almost never. And here's my lecture. I call on you, Mr. Jones, and say, uh, Joe, uh, you know, I got a problem here. This land is full of extraneous traffic. There's all kinds of frames on here that don't belong here. I think someone has a chattering Nick card. There's a big problem. Could you go and troubleshoot and solve it? You turn your computer on and say, happy to. You say, professor, I think you're crazy. I don't see any extra frames. I'm getting all my frames that I need, and there's no extra ones in here. Joe, you're crazy. There's a lot of extra traffic that's slowing us down. Please solve it. No, I'm turned on. I don't see it. Professor, you must be intoxicated. You know what's happening? There is a lot of extra traffic. But your network interface card is operating properly. All the traffic that's going to you and her isn't coming into you. You're not seeing it. But I need you to solve a problem for me. So what you're going to do is, not all NIC cards allow this. You're going to go into your NIC card through software and turn off your gatekeeper function. Your network card just became promiscuous. Now you say, holy mackerel, professor, you were right. I see all this extra traffic. What happened? I say, hey, that's your job. Solve it. You get on with a sniffer protocol analyzer. You're looking around and you see that Pete over there has what's called the chattering Nick card. His Nick card is sending out a lot of garbage. So you say to Pete, can you say, Pete says, I don't know what to do. So you walk over to Pete and you just unplug his computer. As soon as his computer is unplugged, all the extra traffic goes away. Now you're going to give him a new Nick card, a new computer. You're going to solve the problem. By unplugging Pete, you got rid of all the problems. You're done, right? Well, now, if you stay in promiscuous mode, you got a problem because all the legitimate traffic still going to come to you. So you're going to run back to your computer and get out of promiscuous mode. Why? You don't want to get the neighbor's traffic. So here's my, I'm going to go home in a minute. We're done. Here's my thing. If it matches your burned in address, it takes in the frame. If it doesn't match it, it throws it away. If it goes to the broadcast address of all binary ones, it takes it in. If it doesn't have that, it throws it away. Number three never happens. And the reason they're even teaching this is the test likes to ask it, the, the so-called certification test. If you decide for some reason to become promiscuous and you decide that you're going to turn
the gatekeeper function. In that case, you'll get everybody's frames. You wouldn't want to do that as a normal thing. What you'd want to do is turn it off, solve the problem, and then immediately become unpromiscuous so that you're not bothered by everybody else's frames. I might get the neighbor's uh, mail one or two days as a favor, but I wouldn't want to get the neighbor's mail for the rest of the year. See what I'm saying? So you, you go turn promiscuous mode on, which just means you turn the gatekeeper function off, you find out what the problem is and troubleshoot, then you immediately turn the gatekeeper function back on, become unpromiscuous so that you cannot get the neighbor's mail. Do you have to know the burned in address? Yes. Do you have to understand the broadcast address? Yes. Do you have to know promiscuous mode is? Yes. Okay, so we've covered quite a bit. Remember the last three or four slides took me 20 minutes. Hint, 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 all this stuff could be on my first test. Okay, I am going to stop uh, sharing. I have, uh, it's 422, so I think we're cl close enough. When I'm sharing, I can't see who's here. I can't see you guys. I got 24 people here and I know you're gonna start leaving, but I already took attendance. So what we're going to do is we are going to, I'm trying to see if somebody came in that I missed. We'll pick it up on Wednesday. I'll repeat those hard slides and we'll finish this, this whole chapter and we'll be done. Next Monday, we'll start with the questions at the end of chapter two and we'll start chapter three. And whoever asked about the test, the test is the end of September, early October. But we've covered now, chapter one is one third of the first test. And when we finish chapter two, we'll be through with two thirds of the first test. Anybody have any questions, comments, statements? I want to throw a tomato at me. Anybody want to say anything? Because as far as I'm concerned, I'm done for today. I'm worn out. I think you're worn out. So if you have a question, I'm sitting here and asking. If you don't have a question, you can leave. But I'll sit here for 10 minutes as you're leaving. I have a good one as you're leaving. See you all on Wednesday. See you all on Wednesday at this time. I assume the dead silence means you all understood everything. Hey, uh, professor, I have a question. Please, stay in you turn off the... Uh, how do you turn off the... The gatekeeper? How do you turn off the gatekeeper function? Mm -hmm. Is that it? Okay. Yes. Um, not all... Well, first of all, it's software. Not all uh, NIC cards will let you do that. Not all will let you do it. Some network cards, there's a way, I don't even know how actually, there's a way to do it in software. You click on something and you have, so if you have a, a NIC card that allows that, you click on some software that lets you turn it off by clicking and saying, turn it off temporarily or what, and you put it back on. But not all NIC network cards, very cheap ones will not let you do that. So it's a software thing, well, it has to be a driver, and you have to know that the NIC card will allow it. Software and is it the same thing with the uh, promiscuous mode? Promiscuous mode is turning off the gatekeeper function. If you turn off the gatekeeper function, you become promiscuous. If you leave it on, you're non-promiscuous. No. Okay. Oh, I knew I had a problem. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, very good. Have a great one. Um, just quickly, I don't know if you're both still here. I've got a Kevin Morales and a Robert Morales. I knew that would be a problem, but you're both here today, which is good. Well, did one, did one of you, did one of you two, did, did one, okay. All right, so this is your first class meeting, but I've got both of you. All right, but are you in this class or are you in the other class? So I have a Kevin and Robert Morales. I just got to make sure that when we take tests and everything that I keep that all straight. That's all. Okay. That's all, but very good. I was a little confused by that. <laughs> but you're both here today, so that's good. Right. Also, uh, Professor? Go, go um, Yes, me. Uh, I have a, a question. I don't know because you know we're we're learning most of the terms and things like that. Right. However, if I wanted to get more, um, I guess you could say hands-on <laughs> experience, is there like an application that um, kind of simulates um, troubleshooting, like problems that I can troubleshoot to practice? Um, 
No, let me let me try to say this. This is a lecture only course. Now, if you yeah. speak with us, you will take other courses like the Cisco course and the server class where you, it's a lot of hands on labs. Um, I'm trying to think how you could do that to practice. Well, I would just say buy an old computer and fool around with it. <laughs> um, well, here's the problem, though. You, you can't really you can't really see a packet or frame. I mean, it's there, but you can't really see it. Yeah, so, yes. I mean, it's, it's, these are more concepts. Yeah. So people say, if I had a lab, could you show me the packet? No, I can't really show you the packet. It's a bunch of ones and zeros going through. I can't show you the frame. You have to imagine. When we do our seven layers in chapter uh, six or seven. People say, could you show me the seven layers on a, on a one, on a scope? The seven layers are a concept. So the packets and frames are a concept. It didn't happen, but I can't really show them to you and say, here's a packet, here's a frame, see it on the screen or hold it in your hand. So, so what are you getting at? So also, right. sorry. Also, um, I know we skipped over it. Uh, you said you didn't really care about it, but um, going back to like you know a basic wireless router. Um, reading in the textbook, it says that a wireless router combines an access point, a switch, and a router all in one. Yeah. So I'm guessing that um, when it talks about like a switch being on this right, it's a virtual switch. Like it's all like because I don't know. I don't. Uh, no, no. What? No, you're half right. Okay. <laughs> when I say it acts like a hub, it's a virtual hub. But when I say it's got a switch, a hub, and a router, as I think they said, a, a, a switch and a router, that's not a virtual router or a virtual. It actually has a physical small router in it and actually has a physically small switch in it. Not virtual, an actual one. Oh, okay. Gotcha. It's a, it's a real one. It's not an, an it's a real one. <laughs> no. okay. Everything's becoming virtual, so I have to ask. No, 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 no. But okay. Professor, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much. You're doing a great job. Considering Thank you. Oh, All right. See you next time. Very good. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. See you, Professor. All right. So I got two more analysis. I just got them in, and they're both here today. Okay. Good. All right. See you Wednesday. I'll be here. I'll be here.